You're listening to The Dirt on the Past, a show on history and archaeology and why it matters today. You can find us on the Extreme History Project website and also on kgbm.org. Thanks for listening. Welcome to The Dirt on the Past from the Extreme History Project and KGBM Community Radio. Whether digging up a site or dusting off the archives, we bring you some of the most fascinating and cutting-edge research in history and archaeology and discuss why it matters today. Join me, Nancy Mahoney, alongside co-host Crystal Alegria, as we converse with anthropologists, archaeologists, and historians about how they bring the past alive. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of the show. I'm Nancy. And I'm Crystal. And we are co-hosts of The Dirt on the Past. This week, we are at KGVM headquarters, speaking via Zoom with Christopher Merritt. And we're excited to talk with Chris. But before we begin, as usual, um, I want to check in with you, Crystal. So we, we kind of have some exciting news about the Dirt on the Past podcast this week. We do. We yeah. do. Do you, you want to? You go. You go. Okay. You say it. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been thinking about, um, we've been thinking about these candles, these, these candles that have specific scents. Right. You and I both sell candles anyway. You yes. in the Extreme History um, shop and me at Mocha Boutique. And we were sort of thinking, wouldn't it be fun to have dirt on the past scented candles? Right. right. <laughs> so a couple of weeks ago when we were, we were waiting for our guests to join the podcast, we were like, what kind of scents would we like in these candles? And so we jotted down seven, six or seven scents. Yep. And so read them, read them off. Okay. I'm going to read them off. So okay. Secret Archives, Moonlit Cemetery, Ghost Town, Pueblo Ruin, Egyptian Tomb, Dusty Attic, and then our signature scent, Dirt on the Past, which basically smells like dirt. Okay. <laughs> and like, so, kind of fancy dirt. <laughs> yeah. We worked with Kelly Hartman from Studio 308. She makes candles, and she's really a whiz with figuring out how to come up with scents. And we love all her other candles, which remind us of other places in Bozeman and Montana. But man, she knocked it out of the park with she all did. of these. She yeah. Did. I was... had my whole family smell them this week. Yeah. And they were like, that's totally what that smells like. That is a dusty attic, you yeah. know? And, yeah. and people are most, um, on, on either side of the fence on the secret archives one. Really? What do you mean on either side of the fence? Well, they either love it or hate it. Yes. So, <laughs> so Kelly herself, it's not her favorite scent, right, but she right. said other coworkers smell like, were yeah. like, "Oh, I like that." And yeah. um, and so then I I had it out, and my husband, who was a definite no, but then my daughter's boyfriend was like, "I like that one." Wow. So very interesting. So that one definitely goes both ways. So that yeah. um, says something special about you if you like it. I think. <laughs> You know, the consensus at, at Extreme History was that everyone loves the Egyptian tomb. Oh, yeah. That's a lovely one. Candle. Pueblo Ruin, Ruin is beautiful, too. Yeah. That has a yeah. lot of nice floral scents from sort of the Southwest. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, you know, the dirt on the past, as any archaeologist would tell you, they love the smell of dirt. Oh, yeah. And so uh, when I took a smell of the dirt on the past candle, I was like, oh, yeah, I like that. I like that. <laughs> I like the one. I like Moonlit Cemetery and the fresh yeah. cut grass mm -hmm. smell in that one. Mm -hmm. And she puts what what each thing might smell like, and it really does. Like whether it's old leather and old parchment and secret archives, the ghost town one is like barn and yeah. hay and maybe sage or something, and it's really great. So yeah. so those have been um, super exciting. We also got um, sort of our first real email feedback yeah. this past week yeah. about the podcast. We've been, we get a lot of feedback. Um, we, got, we get a, little, a lot of you know, note feedback, like, oh, love the podcast, you know, that kind of thing. But this was a real in-depth uh, feedback. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. With yeah. attachments and everything. Yeah. So Dr. Robert Del awesome. Russo, yeah, yeah, who is, um, has been a contract archaeologist for the University of New Mexico, um, has, has his PhD, and he, I think he said he now lives um, just south of Livingston or so, so he's nearby, and he's been listening, and he listened intently to the program where we interviewed Matthew Bennett because that's the one where we talked about the footprints along the, the lake bed, the ancient lake shore, where we had um, human footprints that we think date back now, or at least their dates show somewhere between 21 and 23,000 years ago. So we, we did that whole podcast, and, and 
part of um, his response was to us commenting that most people in the press, anyway, who had responded to the article originally really felt that those dates were fairly secure. They weren't as squishy and, you know, Mm -hmm. much more confident that we now really have some good evidence for um, humans being on the continent much older than 14 or 15 or 16,000 years before present. So this this could be even people that were here uh, before the last glacial maximum. Mm -hmm. So in any event, um, Dr. De La Russa was kind enough to include a couple of articles which have great references. I'm just going to quickly say the names of both of them. One that he is a co-author on is um, entitled Lake Levels and Trackways, an alternate model to explain the timing of human megafauna trackway interactions. And that particular article was published in um, Quaternary Science Advances um, in 2021. And specifically, they were interested in the article that um, Bennett was on that project that talked about the the sloth prints, Mm -hmm. the, the mastodon prints, and then the human prints, and how it looked like we could actually then see that these things had happened probably within hours of each other. And the team that Dr. Bennett, um, excuse me, Dr. De La Russa worked with, um, says there's so much more they know now about lake levels and about when they were higher and lower and what could have happened in between that their thought is that there could have been, in their alternate model, megafunnel tracks laid down. And then we could have had many thousands of years go by, and when the lake dropped again and winds blew, that they uncovered those tracks, and then it was much more recent human tracks, Mm -hmm. um, sort of post-15,000, 16,000 BP tracks, Mm -hmm. so that these weren't contemporary at all. So now there's no, they're saying this is an alternate model. They Mm -hmm. have good evidence about what's going on with the lake, but I didn't get the sense from that article that it was definitely saying the, the model that... Um, Bennett and his team had proposed wasn't true. So that was one interesting yeah. article. The other one is current understandings of the earliest human occupation in the Americas. And this is an evaluation of another article published in 2020. This one was published in Paleo America in 2021. There is a team of authors I won't read, but the first author is Ben A. Potter. And that article that he included, they go through looking at what is the evidence that humans were in the Americas um, just Clovis period, Clovis first, versus a model of um, pre-Clovis dating back to about 16,000 BP versus uh, something much older than that, an, an older paleo occupation that would predate that, mm-hmm. pre-paleo, I think they were calling it. And they go through and really say the strongest evidence we have now is that we, we have humans pre-Clovis back to about 16,000 BP, but all of the sites before that are problematic in one sense or another for having secure evidence Mm -hmm. of human activity Mm -hmm. or occupation or remains of of human artifacts. And so that was interesting because that particular article, they reviewed many sites, but not the lake site, not Mm -hmm. the site that Bennett had just gotten the dates from, Mm -hmm. um, the particular footprints that were dated, not Mm -hmm. the sloth dates, the ones that went into the terrace. So that most recent one. So um, we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but we just want to have a big shout out to Dr. De La Russa that we're super um, appreciative of his his very thoughtful comments and to calling attention to um, really a little bit more in-depth perspective um, on that. And um, who knows, maybe we can invite him on and we can get Dr. Bennett back and and we can have another little more in-depth discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And if you want more information on on the conversation, look back. We interviewed um, uh, Dr. Bennett about three or four podcasts ago. So look back and find that and have a listen. It was a great interview. Right. Okay, so now we should get back to Chris. Yes, yes. Well, welcome, Chris. We're so glad to have you with us today. Thanks you so much for having me here today. It's going to be fun to chat with you about this cool project. Great, great. So, Chris, we want to start off first by telling our listeners a little bit about you. Okay, so Chris Merritt received his Ph.D., so he's Dr. Merritt, from the University of Montana in anthropology in 2010. His research focused on archaeological and historical investigations of the overseas Chinese. Since 2012, 
Dr. Merritt has worked on as an archaeologist for the Utah Division of State History and is the Utah's State Historic Preservation Officer. He has spent time investigating the life and role of Chinese and Japanese railroad workers in Utah since arriving in the state. So welcome, Chris. We and also long walks on the beach. And lo- <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. And what's Love your favorite it. ice cream flavor? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll get to all that. <laughs> yes, yes. So, Chris, you and I have had the opportunity to work together um, many years ago. Uh, you did a lot of archaeological um, uh, survey work at the Rosebud Battlefield, and so we took a group of teachers out to the battlefield, we think in 2013. We were talking before we started the podcast, and we came to the conclusion it was 2013 that we did this, but we took a group of teachers out to the Rosebud Battlefield and did some archaeological survey with them. They kind of helped us do some archaeological survey. It was a great day. I remember that day so well. And uh, it was just beautiful. And it was a wonderful learning opportunity for those educators. And um, a a wonderful learning opportunity for myself as well to get to work with you. So, um, So anyway, I just am so glad that you're on here, not to talk about the battle, the Rosebud battlefield, but about something completely different. So we like to start off with asking our guests um, how they became interested in their field of study. And your field of study, of course, is archaeology. So what brought you to this field? Yeah, I I, I have to say I started out as a nerd very early in my life. Um as I was starting to get into junior high school, I, I really loved history. And like every history course I took, I just fell in love and wanted to learn more and more and more. And, you know, I started doing that career, looking to the forward, like what do historians do? And to the historians listening, this is not an offensive thing, but it sounded really boring. Um, <laughs> I hear you. To be a straight historian. Hey, wait a minute now. <laughs> <laughs> Old documents um, are not boring. <laughs> <laughs> True, but to a you know eleven year old, you know it sounded fairly straightforwardly boring. And yeah, you know, I've come as, through my career to just love passionately the the practice of history and the research of history. Um, but it was like I want to do more. I want to go explore it. I want to go touch it. I want to go find it. And that's when I kind of found that archaeology was that path to where I could connect my true passion of archaeology or or of history with the physical, tangible parts of our past in a, in a much more direct way. And, you know, I grew up with my grandparents that drove us everywhere every summer to go visit historic sites, the little bighorn. I remember visiting when I was seven, um, driving all the way out from Michigan uh, to go to the little bighorn battlefield. And it's like, that's, that's the kind of stuff that really was impassioning for me. And so I was the only person in my high school that requested an archaeologist come and talk on career day. (laughs) And so we were actually able to get a a biblical archaeologist from one of the universities in Southern uh, Michigan, where I'm, where I grew up in the lower peninsula and biblical stuff wasn't my bag, but I just sat there like, oh my, look at all the stuff that they found and how it weaves with the stories um, of those periods and the objects and how we can understand what those objects mean to the people. And it's like sold. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, that day, you know, I was the only one that probably went down that path in that room. The other mm-hmm. people were, you know, drifting off into space in their minds. But yeah. from that point on in high school, I'm like, this is what I want to do. And uh, when I, I actually did my undergraduate at the University of Montana, as well as my, my doctorate. And that was, you know, as soon as I graduated high school, my family went West um, just because we loved it in the West. I spent my entire life in Michigan to that point. And we landed in Missoula, Montana. And, uh, you know, I, we went there specifically because of the University of Montana's undergraduate program in anthropology and archaeology and like, Ta-da. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was once I took that first archaeology course at a college level, I'm like, yep, this is the right call for me. Um, but yeah, that's it's kind of a weird thing. I knew and, you know, a true seven believer years old, from an early old, age. I, I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I couldn't believe people could do it for a living. I, I got really interested in <laughs> in things like when I was really young, like in the early 1970s, it was like, even Louis Leakey and Don Johansson finding Lucy, all those skulls. So I, I loved all of it. If it was super old paleo stuff. And then 
you know, I think there was a huge King Tut exhibit in New York. Or, and oh, so there yeah. was so much going on that I couldn't believe. I was like, but how do those people get to do it? And when people are like, well, they go to school for it. it. Yeah, same with you. I was like, well, there was really no other choice for me beyond that. It just didn't seem like anything else could possibly compare to being able to do that. So I can very much relate. And now um, you finished your degree and you are the state historic preservation officer for the state of Utah. And that is a term that Crystal and I are very familiar with. Um, so many of us work closely with state historic preservation officers if we are historians or archaeologists. But I'm not sure that um, many of our listeners actually know what that work entails. So tell us a little bit about the State Historic Preservation Office itself, and then what roles and responsibilities you have as the officer. And, oh. and by the way, when we use the word SHPO, when we say SHPO, that's that's short for State Historic Preservation <laughs> Officer, which we're very quickly going to get tired of saying. Yeah. So you're the SHPO. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a little tidbit now for cocktail parties for yeah. all our listeners. Be like, hey, do you know what a SHPO does? Yeah, yeah really. There, there go. we go. Okay. Okay. Love it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I always joke it's the it's the four letter word. Yeah, you know, <laughs> depends on who you're talking Beginning to. Beginning with us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no, that's a great question. So so few folks outside our industry really understand what these offices do nationwide, mm-hmm. and so I'm really appreciative. While we're going to talk about a different topic, to be able to talk to your listeners about what is the role of a shipo, a say sort of preservation office. And it's one of those things too, going to your point, Nancy, like I'm kind of shocked when I wake up in the morning, I'm getting paid to do this job um, just because it's like so passionate and so much fun. So to put it in context for the listeners in 1966, when the National Historic Preservation Act passed under uh, Lyndon Johnson's administration, part of this law created a state level office that is under the governor to promote and execute preservation programming and to work collaboratively with our federal partners, whether they're departments of transportation or uh, state forest service or national forest services or Bureau of land management, you know, those agencies have a lot of responsibilities when it comes to cultural resources. And so that act created all the offices that we see, like the Montana SHPO, uh, which I worked very closely during my dissertation because they were just amazing professionals that helped me at every turn of my research. But these offices were really a, a great federalist idea in that there was a this federal government creating this federal act, but a recognition that there needed to be a state level. Uh, organization that could coordinate those activities, be the voice of the governor and the people of Utah more directly in these federal actions. And Utah got its um, SHPO office created in 1969. So very soon after the passage of the Historic Preservation Act. And we do everything that is issued by the Park Service. So we manage the National Register of Historic Places seeing those plaques on historic buildings that this is listed on the National Register. We manage that program and working with private landowners and and property owners to get those things listed to be recognized for their significance. We work with local governments. We have a certified local government program and we're mandated uh, to pass through portions of our appropriation from the National Park Service to local communities to do preservation projects. And so we work with cities, towns, counties, to pass through this grant money to promote building rehabilitations, archaeological surveys and testing, National Register listings, you know, as a way to promote preservation on a very grassroots level. We have a tax credit program that we manage. So if you're a business and you're moving into a historic building and you want to do rehab work, we can work with you so the building is preserved in an appropriate way while you're doing a rehab, but then you get money back on your federal taxes. And so this is a big incentive program for people to reuse these really cool historic buildings for business purposes. Right, right. Um, and then the other two quick parts of our program is um, the compliance world that I started at the Utah Ship in 2012 is working with all our state partner or all our federal partners. And in Utah, we actually have a state law equivalent to the National Historic Preservation Act. So I work with all the state agencies too. When they're doing a road widening or they're doing a prescribed fire or they're doing oil and gas leasing, we work collaboratively with our agencies to ensure that they're taking the cultural resources into account during those planning actions. 
And then statutorily, this is the exciting one for me because I can touch everything. Um, In statute, we are the central repository for all archaeological and historic building information for the state. Mm -hmm. Uh, We are the BLM data stewards. We manage the Bureau of Land Management um, for all their field offices. They come to us. We have computer systems called GIS, Geographic Information Systems, that maintains the spatial data. Uh, we have 117,000 known archaeological sites in the state of Utah, mm-hmm. and we manage all that spatial and paper record uh, with a records team. Uh, and then very lastly, and it's a transition, is we've turned in the last five years to be more outward facing too. So we've built an outreach program through a retirement and some digital processes. We were able to convert a position that was largely administrative now to an outward face. And that is how we're starting to get a lot more people interested in archaeology and preservation in Utah. Yeah, that's great. I'm so glad to hear that. It's so important to have that outreach and education aspect of that. So now just um, for our listeners, can you talk about what cultural cultural resources are? Because we'll probably use that word a lot today. So what are cultural resources in your definition? Cultural resources in my definition... I'm an archaeologist, so I'm going to really bring it, is our collective past. So I consider the garbage that you're putting in your trash can today is a cultural resource. It's an expression of the past, whether it's five minutes ago or 13,000 years ago. And so in the eyes of the law, cultural resources are um, archaeological or historical, generally over 50 years old. Um, and could be historic buildings, could be Pueblo sites, could be Clovis sites or old railroad camps. And so it kind of captures this broad scale. But in the last 20 years, we've increased that too, of thinking of plants uh, and Native American connections to plants. Those are cultural resources. While they're not made by humans, they're being used by them. And so we've tried to broaden the tent of what that term means to be more inclusive of the folks that still live and occupy this land. And we manage these resources, whether on public land or private land. Okay. That, that helps. Thanks, Chris. I, I love that definition. So that's what you do now, but I want to go back a little bit in time and talk about some of your PhD research um, that you did at the university of Montana. You had a focus on the historic Chinese communities in Montana And so can you tell us a little bit about this research and what came from your research at um, U of M when you were looking at these historic Chinese communities? So much fun I had in Montana. Um, Um, We miss you here in Montana. (laughs) We have a lot of fun here in Montana. We do. We do. (laughs) I still consider Montana my true love when it comes to a state. I love it. I love supporting our, our folks here in Utah, but it's like Montana is just overpowering with the landscapes and the history up there. And Um, But yeah, so in my PhD, so I I got my undergraduate at the University of Montana, and then I went back to Michigan and got a master's of science in industrial archaeology and uh, and then got lured back by Dr. Kelly Dixon at the University of Montana. And she's still there. She was my dissertation chair and one of the loveliest people you'll ever meet. Mm. Um, And she's a historical archaeologist. And so she's like, will you come back to Montana? We just started this new PhD program. Uh, And like, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to come back. And it's, it's a weird story. People are always like, why did you pick the Chinese? Like, it's an unsatisfying answer is that there was money. Mm. Um, there was there was grant money grant through money. the uh, mm. Forest Service to, to start investigating some sites in Western Montana. Well, just say there's an opportunity. There was an opportunity. <laughs> there's an opportunity. <laughs> we don't have to yes. be so crass yeah, about it. Yeah. <laughs> but we all know what that means. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so... So when I started working with, um, you know, the Montana's PhD program and the Forest Service, I just like, okay, this is a story. This is a niche that has not been really touched. And Bob Swartow, um, you know, wrote the first article on the Chinese in Montana in the 1980s, but really scholarship had not moved since the 1980s into the 2000 uh, period on the Chinese contribution. And so I'm like, this is my focus. I am going to try to reconstruct the history of the Chinese population in the state of Montana that had been largely erased 
from state history because of some of the very restrictive federal legislation about immigration in the 19th century, that by post-1900, the Chinese had largely disappeared from the cultural landscape of Montana or became extremely small versus 1870 when one out of every 10 Montanans was Chinese. And if you're in Helena, one out of every five Mm -hmm. uh, were Chinese. So how did we lose that history? And my focus for my dissertation was diving into that. And it did get published by the University of Nebraska Press, The Coming Man from Canton. There's a shameless plug right there for you. There we go. We'll get it. We'll get it on the website too. Don't worry. (laughs) Yep. Um, But I feel I feel really uh, happy with the work because I know it's not the end all be all. And hopefully it's a launching point for further investigations because I touched so many topics on the surface. We did some excavations, Mm -hmm. we did some field schools, but there's so much more that we need to learn about the Montanan uh, legacy of of the Chinese and what that meant to our state's development. Right. Someone told me when I was um, back in school for American Studies doctoral research, they said one of the best places to look for a good topic is in other people's doctoral dissertations, because that is where you, you get onto a topic and you can't, you start to figure out there's all these other wonderful issues and rabbit holes to go down and you can't address them. So it's often, Bob Rydell used to always say that, Dr. Rydell, like in the footnotes of somebody's dissertation or something or or in the aside. So it's, um, it's no surprise to me that people could be mining your doctoral work for wonderful um, research going forward. But, um, but we've been seeing that you've been able to continue your work researching and writing about the historic Chinese communities in the West, um, even in Utah. So including a project uh, in Terrace, Utah, so a town that no longer exists, but was a railroad community. So tell us a little bit about Terrace itself, why it was developed and, and about how long it lasted just to situate us. Absolutely. And as everyone's career, there's always these weird flows and shifts and turns, and sometimes you always just circle right back. Um, So when I left Montana, I I came to Utah, worked for the Forest Service as a seasonal archaeologist. Getting a PhD in 2010 was not the greatest idea I've ever had. Um, Economic recession, not a lot of jobs. So, uh, you know, you went where the jobs were. And so when I landed in, in Utah, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm working for the forest. I love that work. I worked contract for a year and then I landed the job with the state. And like, finally, I have some roots. I can start building what I want to uh, do for my career going forward. And Utah showed so prominently in my research in Montana because of the connection of the Chinese to the railroad. Mm -hmm. is the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869 became the launching off point for thousands of Chinese immigrants coming to Montana's gold rush. And so I knew about Utah and I knew about the Transcontinental story before, you know, living in Utah for all intents and purposes. So I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to land in the state where we had 13,000 Chinese workers on the Transcontinental Railroad. There's going to be tons of interest and material and books. And uh, uh, no, there's nothing. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Wow. A blank slate. Archaeological. uh, (laughs) Really, truly a blank slate. I mean, there have been some great histories written for the Transcontinental, but it focused on the financiers, the presidents, Mm -hmm. the engineers, very little on the workers. Um, the archaeological you know, investigations up here, we, we haven't done a lot of good work on historical archaeology in Utah because we don't have a, an academic institution that trains students here, or has a program in historical archaeology. So there was never an interest in doing a lot of historic period work. So it was great. It was a blank slate. It was like, oh, man, I'm doing Montana again, where I'm kind of building from scratch yeah. um, a research program and a basis of understanding the histories. And the transcontinental lured me in is that it's such a nationwide narrative and it altered everybody's lives. And I'm not saying everybody in the term of the United States, I'm like everybody's lives changed globally with the completion of the transcontinental railroad after the American civil war, it just reshaped our economy. It reshaped immigration. Um, It was a major driver of, I I would consider world history because you think of its connections to labor and supply networks and economies of scale. And so I started working with the Bureau of Land Management, Salt Lake City Field Office, and we started driving this landscape in very northwestern Utah. And many people don't know that we have a national treasure 
in Utah that no other state has. And that is we have 87 contiguous miles of the original Transcontinental Railroad. It was built in 1869, abandoned in 1942 when they built the Great Salt Lake Cutoff, which cuts right across Great Salt Lake. And this northern arm that was built in 1869 became disused after 1904 when we built the cutoff. And by World War II, the railroad was successfully able to abandon that landscape, and then it converted to a road. And then in the 80s, the Bureau of Land Management acquired that that chunk. So you can drive from the Nevada border all the way into Golden Spike National Historical Park, where they have the fancy choo-choo trains. um, And you can drive on the railroad as it was built. Um, Other than ties and rails, those have been removed, but you can really explore this fascinating, immense Mm -hmm. landscape that in places, there's no cell phone towers, there's no power lines, there's no houses, you're you're transmitted back to 1869 for all intents and purposes. Uh, And this is a long way of getting around to your question about tariffs. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Good setup, good setup. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know. I'm a verbose guy to begin with, but when you talk to an archaeologist or historian, it's like, well, let me tell you the four hour background to answer that one question. (laughs) Um, (laughs) You're doing good, though. You're doing good, Chris. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. We got the four minutes. Yeah, we got good. good. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, you haven't cut me off yet. (laughs) Um, But so, Terrace. Terrace was created in 1869 as a station along this railroad. It is three hours drive time from Salt Lake City. It is an hour and a half from the closest bathroom. It is out there in the middle of nowhere. But if you were there in 1870s, it was big. You know, Mm -hmm. 400, 500, 600 people living along the railroad. It had maintenance shops and roundhouses for the trains, coal bins, a main street with over 20 businesses. You know, 600 people in this bustling community that grew up around the railroad. Yeah, from and, what I was reading in your report, it's more that it it was um, a, a place of convenience for between stations, between other places. It wasn't that there was any natural draw or already existing community there, right? It was a constructed community around the railroad. S- spot on. Is If you were out there, you're like, why the heck did they put a town that size here? And it wasn't for the comfort of the residents. It was for the ease of the railroad. Okay. Is that as you were you know, traveling on train either direction, if your train broke down, and steam engines were prone to have breakdowns, where do you put it? These are single track lines for most of them. How do you repair a steam train in the middle of nowhere? Well, you build facilities mm-hmm. and turned out Terrace was a good middle ground mm-hmm. between the, the industrial works in Elko and Winnemucca, Nevada, and the new industrial works forming in Ogden, Utah. It was kind of that nice middle point. And so it was a place that you could repair trains effectively in between those spots versus trying to have to haul a train 180 miles to get serviced. And so, yeah, it was completely a matter of where the railroad wanted that town. And it, it's also indicated by the water story is that they had to pipe water for 13 miles underground using redwood logs to bring water from the mountains down to the actual town, primarily for trains, second for people. I mean, that's what's Um, really saying something about it built for convenience of the railroad, not for any reasonable reason that has to do with the landscape or the people. We're going to take a quick station break and then get back with another question about Terrace. You're listening to The Dirt on the Past with co-hosts Crystal Alegria and Nancy Mahoney on KGVM Bozeman or wherever you find your podcasts. We're speaking today with Christopher Merritt about his work as an archaeologist and his research on the historic Chinese communities in the West. So, Chris, you've talked a little bit about what Terrace was. It was this community that was built specifically for the railroad. And so the people who were living in the town of Terrace were often railroad workers. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. And so as we know, if you think back to your fourth grade history book or your eighth grade history, that a lot of the people that worked on our railroads here in the United States were Chinese. And so, of course, Terrace had a Chinese community. So, um, so did, so, so did a Chinese community form in Terrace because it was this place where uh, they would repair the the locomotives, they would do work on them. What were so? What can you tell me a little bit about why the Chinese community was here in Terrace? 
yeah, the it's amazing to think of some of these communities when you drive through northern Utah today is they were more metropolitan, more diverse in the 19th century than they are now. And that is because of the impact of the railroad and the jobs that that provided. The Central Pacific Railroad, which went from Sacramento and met at Promontory Summit here in Utah, that was constructed by 13,000 Chinese laborers, um, 1864 to 1869. But after the completion of the railroad, thousands of those workers remained in the employment of the railroad companies. And then also including the UP, the Union Pacific, who picked up the Chinese workers after 1870. So the Chinese workers stayed on to maintain that railroad okay. for the next 30 effective years from 1869 to about 1900, the dominant worker on the railroad doing the, the manual labor task of fixing the ballast, replacing the ties, replacing the rails. Those were Chinese Uh we have, after 1900, an immigration shift, and because of the legislation targeting the Chinese in the 19th century, the railroads had to find new workers. So that's when we see, post-1900, a shift to Japanese labor, mm-hmm. uh, Greek labor, Italian labor. And, but for this glorious 30 years, our nation's railroads were maintained by workers that had fled or immigrated from China in search of a better life here in the United States. Uh, to support whether families back home or or with the dream that they could bring their families here. And Terrace, as a microcosm of that story, it was formed in 1869. They based section crews there. Section crews is a term just for the 10 to 15 workers that maintain a a segment of the railroad line. They would go out every day, make sure everything's in order, replace railroad ties if needed, do the real hard labor. And so that was a drumbeat of every eight to 10 miles, you would see 10 to 15 Chinese workers from Sacramento to Omaha, Nebraska. If you took a train in those years, you would see those same faces repeated. Um, They always would also have generally have white or usually Irish foremen overseeing their labor. So it's kind of very interesting cultural connection. Terrace had that section crew, but because of those big industrial works, uh, the roundhouse and, and all that maintenance shop, there was a bigger Chinese community there because because of the the need for more labor. And so the Chinese at Terrace, you know, were section crews, but they were also engine wipers and working in the boiler shop and and cleaning steam engines and a lot of that. So in 1870, um, Terrace was the third largest Chinatown in the state of Utah. Well, at that time, the territory of Utah. Um, and, And that spoke to how important this was, not only for the railroad to invest all this labor, but also for the Chinese community, that this was becoming a hub for those workers on either side of Terrace that could come in there on the weekends or on days off and have some community yeah. forming. Uh, so 1870s, 1880s, uh, all the way up to 1900, there was a big Chinese community in Terrace and a Chinatown uh, yeah. that formed on the wrong side of the tracks. Um, no, it was on the opposite side of the true. tracks from Main Street, Weird opposite side, side from... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the opposite side from the white side of town, mm-hmm. behind the industrial works, on the salt flat. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it was a, a vibrant community that had this trans-Pacific connection to the homeland, plus people that were just here trying to make a living for a new life. Mm-hmm. So when you say the Chinese community, does that mean just men or were there women and families there, children? Uh, what did that What did that community look like? Great question. And it's, it's one of those great horrors of history is the folks that wrote about the Chinese didn't care about the Chinese mm-hmm. in the 19th century. The census takers in 1870 and then 1880, they offer us snapshots of who was in this community, uh, 10 year sort of glimpses. It was only men in the 1870 census. There was one woman in 1880 census. So this was a largely bachelor or not bachelor. I, I don't like using that term. This was a largely male society. Right, right. Um, in the 19th century and early 20th century, a lot of writers that hated Chinese labor would always call them bachelor societies. Like many of these men were probably married right, um, right. and their families were back home in China and they were sending money home to support them. Yeah. Um, so we have very limited snapshots from the census records. We have zero letters from the Chinese themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, there's very few even photographs of the town of Terrace. And so what we're only able to see are these small glimpses through census records of a largely male community with probably some women, likely no children. Well, children by our standards. Um, mm-hmm. The youngest railroad worker I have found is 14 years old, doing the same labor as a 30-year-old man. Uh, but that means 
effectively you're not a child anymore if you're right. swinging an eight pound sledge and doing a 10 hour work day. Mm-hmm. Um, so we don't know fully because the history records are bad, but that's why archaeology is so important. Right. And yeah. so that's our brings us to our next question, because there's um, a lot of historical documents from the railroad companies themselves. You've mentioned census data and uh, newspaper accounts and things like that. So there is historical records to some degree, but as you said, nobody who was writing them was necessarily um, really caring or writing in any understanding, empathetic, or favorable way about the Chinese. But so tell us about the archaeological investigations that have happened at Terrace and um, sort of what was undertaken there in terms of different archaeological projects and what kind of things have been learned from those? Archaeology is fundamental to understanding the Chinese experience in the United States and almost every other continent that the Chinese went to in the 19th century because of the systemic erasure or omission of the Chinese from the record. Uh, Whether doing research in Montana or Utah, the only time you see the Chinese appearing in newspaper records is when something bad happened. Right, like a police you know, and, and that is a yeah. very, it's, that's a very hard lens to look through when you want to understand the lives of these folks. And so archaeology offers us that, that greater lens is that we don't ignore the bad things, but we want to understand the more deeper social lives and cultural lives of these uh, Chinese immigrants in the 19th century. Terrace is a historic site of the first order. When I first walked on it, it was amazing because it had access to every international product, but also no trash dumps. um, That means the material culture didn't go very far. And so you walk across the site and it is just physically covered. You cannot step without tripping over historic period artifacts. And we can see the Chinatown, which never appeared in records, by the way. We only found Chinatown by the cluster of Chinese material culture. You know, soy pots and rice bowls and and everything else that you would expect in a classic Chinatown. And when we first brought um, some groups out, leading up to the 2019 150th anniversary of the driving of the golden spike. My passion was like, I, I love those choo-choo trains at golden spike, but I want to get people out where history was actually made by the workers and the folks that maintained it. Mm-hmm. And so we took people out there on that three hour tour. It feels like a Gilligan's Island joke starting. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, Only you knew where and, were you going and yeah. you got back. Yeah, yeah but they, you, everyone was the, probably the visitors were a little worried at points. <laughs> Out in the middle yeah, of especially, nowhere. Especially the lack of bathroom facilities. Yeah. That was our number one concern. It's like the whole, all of nature is your bathroom. Um, and so when we started walking people across the site, one of the groups we took were members of the Chinese River Workers Descendant Association. And they were passionate about like, why, why is this laying out here? Because I talked about a lot of the looting and vandalism that oh, yeah. occurred over this site over the last 40 years of people looking for bottles and fancy things. Like, why are you just letting this sit? And why are you letting people steal our heritage? And to an archaeologist, that's a fairly call to action, if you ever heard one. Yeah. And so in 2020, uh, in the midst of the, the COVID, we did a, a, a targeted excavation in Chinatown, the first ever archaeological excavation in Terrace that was done by archaeologists, I should say. Yeah. Um, and then in May 2021, we did a follow-up. So we did two weeks of excavation targeting Chinatown in particular, even though it's a massive site, 400 acres, probably this thing covers. And we focused there because that was the story that was most missing from the narrative is the Chinese story. And also the, the a tremendous support from the Chinese community to do this excavation. And, and some of your you know, other folks that have come on from archaeology community, not every descendant community is thrilled to have right. archaeologists digging in their history. That is true. The Chinese told us to, <laughs> and I'm following their orders. Oh, good. Um, and so, yeah, the excavations were targeting just to start getting a deeper lens of understanding what life was like for a Chinese immigrant in Terrace, uh, you know, 1869 to 1900-ish. Okay. So, so when you were doing this, um, archaeological excavation dur- during those two field seasons, you uncovered a house belonging to a 19th century Chinese worker or workers. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this discovery and what came from the, what con, what was in the house? What kind of artifacts you found in the house and what really 
can that tell you? Of course, the information is the most important part. The artifacts are wonderful, but it's the information, of course, that as archaeologists mm -hmm. we glean. So, yeah, the we we pulled out the old archaeological trick. You're like, where are we going to dig? Like, how about that upright post that's coming out of the sand dune? That's maybe a good starting point. And what we were able to do is we dropped units on outside and inside of a Chinese house randomly. And we're like, okay, these boards look in place. It seems to be a structural wall. What shocked us is when we got to the bottom of that unit, that there is still floorboards wow. in this wow. cabin. Wow. And I had some biases walking into this. I pictured fairly rudimentary structures that mm. the Chinese were building, you know, dugouts, you know, dug into the hillside, fairly sod buster style, right? Kind of very Spartan buildings. But when we actually found those floorboards and, and scoped it out, I was like, no, they had uh, about seven foot by 12 foot uh, building, vertical slabs of Douglas fir and redwood. Um, so different architectural style than we typically see. But this was a substantial building that while small, it had a lot of heavy elements. And then when we start looking at what was inside that house, you start seeing that person. It's not a statistic yeah. as much. Yeah. It's what was this person doing? You know, what were they eating? What was their recreation? And the artifacts can help us understand that. And so we did find uh, gaming pieces, sort of the little black and white Othello, but the, the Chinese called it Wei Qi. Mm -hmm. It's a game. We found those. So playing games after hours, um, different types of ceramic vessels. So tableware. Uh, the Chinese imported all, all the things I'm going to list off were imported from China okay. along this massive uh, economic scale and then dumped in this town in the middle of nowhere, Montana or Utah. Um, and so with tablewares of different patterns, stoneware vessels imported from China with soy sauce and pickled you know, eggs and all these other goods that would have been in there. So they're practicing a traditional Cantonese, South China food way. Uh, most of the immigrants in the 19th century came from South China. Uh, one of the weirdest things is just because the preservation is so beautiful is literally at the end of the excavation, we had the Lieutenant governor of Utah come out and we're just talking and we're doing some light digging. And we opened up one unit to let the VIPs do some fun, you know, get them dirty a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we started screening the dirt and two inches below the ground surface, we found peanut shells, uh, melon seeds from Chinese melons, uh, oh, Chinese wow. date seeds, oh, wow. and the husk of a coconut. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Those are not native to Western No, Utah, I was going to say, so those are being imported from a ways away. Wow. At that, that point by, by railroad, I'm assuming, if it was, mm -hmm. yeah, complete. Uh, wow. I mean, that's, that's crazy. What an amazing um, thing to find to be able to tell what people were eating. You know, mm -hmm. not just the vessels they were eating them in. And the effort the actual... that they were going to to get those yeah. items all the way there. And yeah. as you said, you know, the railroad, the way it changes the world. But just seeing that, seeing that show up right there in Utah. Mm -hmm. um, how did or how do you mention working with the descendant community of Chinese who are very interested in wanting you to, to dig there? Um, tell us a little bit more about how the collaboration initially formed, but then also um, with all of the things you found, the information, the artifacts, um, are they able to engage with the artifacts? What has come of the information? Did they have thoughts on how it should be turned into public archaeology or something like that? Give us a, a little window into that experience. As I said before, I would be doing none of this except for the passion of the descendant community. Mm -hmm. Um in 2019, when we took the descendant community out, um, it was formed here. The Chinese Railroad Workers Descendant Association was formed in Salt Lake City to celebrate all of the Chinese workers' contributions to the Transcontinental Railroad. So we're lucky that we have the seat. But it's a very still small Chinese community here in Utah. And the founder was uh, Judge Michael Kwan. He was the first Chinese-American judge in state history. He sadly passed last year. Mm -hmm. um, and then his sister State Representative Karen Kwan, first Chinese American Utah State Representative. She's now taken the mantle of running the organization. Um, and then we have a, a 55 year plus businesswoman who created the first Cantonese restaurant post World War II in Utah. She's a member of this group. And, and when we took them out there, this is the group that forms and, and still helps us today in excavation and, and support and, and boosterism, as we also awful time need in archaeology as people, you know, shaking the tin can to get us money and support. And 
So both excavations, we had members of the Chinese community camping with us, excavating with us, working side by side with us, um, helping check my biases Mm -hmm. as a a white middle class archaeologist um, that, yes, I've spent most of my adult life at this point studying the Chinese experience, but I'll never be Chinese. I'll never be in that cultural group or understand all the nuances. And so having that relationship has been fundamental in this project is I'm really good with the dirt and the broken bits. And a lot of the Chinese community don't understand these objects like I do because of the disconnect, because of the Exclusion Act and post-World War II uh, immigration. So they don't recognize the things. But once you explain what it is and how it functions, suddenly those connections like, oh, this is what I use today. This is how I use it in the household oh, today. Oh, this is what nice. I can get in Chinatown. Oh, um, and then other times there is a rock on the surface. We walked past it a hundred times. And one of the Chinese women that was working with us, she's like, don't you guys care about that rock? I'm like, the rock and she picked it up she's like no it's a whetstone see it's all polished right here i use this in a a work camp in china to sharpen our knives and like yep that's exactly what that is (laughs) wow yep that's awesome that's that's a great collaboration yeah that is so you know chris you really feel like public archaeology is important we've had a few conversations about how important it is and you said already on this podcast that's so important to get the information that you're gleaning from these archaeological sites out to the public um, in one way or another. and um, But can you elaborate on that a little bit more and just tell us a little bit more why you think this is important and why you have really pushed for that in your job at SHPO to really um, have a public component to everything you do? First and foremost, I work for the public. Yep. yep. That is my job. Right, right. And one of the critiques I've always seen from the public towards archaeologists is that we're cliquish, we're elitish, we can't communicate to the public, our, our writing is inaccessible. Um, so if we're getting that feedback, we're not doing a good job. Right. Because... One, as an archaeologist, I want to share this really cool stuff. I want people to learn about their past in a way that you can't normally learn. And that's tactile, that's hands-on, the stories that have been omitted by history. I want that relationship because these things on public lands are the public trust. And if we refuse, and I'm going to say refuse, to talk to the public, or we fail to talk to the public effectively, why are we complaining as a profession that nobody cares? Like it's our fault that nobody cares. If we haven't done the job of making that connection and making it understandable of why these places are important, why we need to preserve and protect these places. Why is it important to have descendant community voices in putting on how public lands are managed? It's our mandate as archeologists. I don't care if you work for the state government, federal government, academic institutions, It's our job to take this information that we are taking from the public trust and putting it back into the public so they can enjoy it, learn from it. And at the end of the day, hopefully learn. Um, Yeah, we did this excavation in May and of this year, and it was right at that upswing of anti-Asian violence nationwide. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. How fundamental of a story to talk about, like, this is not new, guys. Right. Let's talk about history now. Right. This is just a new peak in a sy- system of violence right. that has been perpetrated against Asian Americans since their arrival on this continent. But also, flip it on its head. Here's a great collaboration. Working side by side with the Chinese community. Telling good, positive stories. Making people understand each other on a personal level. Removing that, that xenophobia that we oftentimes get. So, To me, public outreach is fundamental to archaeology. It should have been the first class I took in undergraduate um, is communicating to the public of why this is important because I didn't have to be convinced. Right. Me me either. And I I just I love your message. I think that's exactly what Crystal and I are most interested in doing with this podcast and with everything we do. Um, And it's so nice to find a, a shippo who has that first and foremost. So, you know, we don't want you to get buried under paper and records. And we know that's such a big part of your job. And that's wonderful (laughs) when we want to access them. But having that public mission is so fundamental, but I'm sure it makes your job that much more interesting. Um, And I think that so many more shippos are really heading in the same direction you are. 
um, you know, in in including that public component of, of everything they do. I know our Montana SHPO is is really wanting to do that as well. So, and there is one SHPO in every state. So, um, right. I that, think they should clone you guys. Though. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's homework for whoever's listening is to find out who your shippo in your state is. <laughs> yeah, go get to know them. Tell them you're interested. Right. Yeah. Well, Chris, we um, there are so many more things we would love to talk with you about, and we'll probably ask you at a future date to come back. Um, but our time's running short. So we just want to say thank you. And it was so wonderful to hear all about your job, but about your research and about just sort of from your perspective, how to do archaeology through this sort of federal state institution of historic preservation offices. So thanks for that. We really appreciate it. Yeah. And Chris, I just wanted to ask if there's any future excavations happening at Terrace and or are there any articles coming out about what you found during your archaeological excavation in, this year? Yeah. So first, thank you, too, for making this opportunity available to to continue to spread these messages i think that we're all as a an industry as archaeology trying to do a better job so first thank you guys for doing this um, and to your question crystal is with two years of excavation we're going to do mostly lab work this year we're going to okay. do another volunteer-led project i should have mentioned like these are all volunteer-led projects yeah. you know that we were out there but volunteers did all the work so we're going to do a lab-based one uh, this upcoming year, we're going to have an article in Smithsonian Magazine oh, and National Wonderful. Geographic come out. Oh, um, and, and National get, Geographic? Oh, yep. that's so exciting. Wonderful. And and then that gives us that, that great public space. And then we're going to start diving into the more technical reporting, right, okay. that all archaeologists have to do. So we're hoping to get, once we get all these artifacts processed, sorted, start really publishing a lot of stuff in 2022. Okay, Great. well, we want our three-hour tour before yeah, that happens. Yeah, we want the yeah. three-hour tour. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I've been out there so many times. Uh, and Chris, if people are interested in participating as a volunteer, is there opportunities for that, um, for to do lab work with, with, with you, with these artifacts? Excellent and timely question, Crystal. Oh. So we actually just posted um, the advertisement for the volunteer project that we're going to be doing at the end of January and early February. Uh, and we, we work through Passport and Time, which okay. is an amazing volunteer program that was started by the United States Forest Service, but now other agencies, including Bureau of Land Management, can participate in. And so we're going to run another PIT project, Passport and Time, in, in January. So that just went live on passportandtime.org. And, .org. and okay. so people Perfect. can go register and apply. And I hope to see some names on there that are familiar. That's great. great. That's oh, that's great. so exciting. Well, thank you so much, Chris. It was great to have you here today with us. Thank you too so much. Yeah. And thanks to all our listeners out there for joining us today. If you love this podcast, we ask you to share it with a friend and make sure to subscribe so it shows up for you every week in your podcast app. We also have a Facebook page called The Dirt on the Past, so make sure to find that and like it. So thanks so much to Chris for joining us today, and thanks to all of you listening out there. We hope you can join us again to find out more about The, the Dirt, Dirt on, on the, the past. past. We'd also love to give a great big shout out to our sponsor for this podcast, which is the Western Heritage Center located in Billings, Montana. So if you're in the area, be sure to stop in and say hello to the staff at the Western Heritage Center. They always have engaging exhibits, and the people who work there are always ready to answer questions. In the summer months, they do historic walking tours of historic buildings, so make sure to check that out. A big thank you to them, and thanks for their continued support of the dirt on the past. A big thank you to our editor and sound guru, Steve Durbin, and our sound mixer, Lawson Alegria, and to John Chadwell for getting the podcast out in the world. If you're enjoying The Dirt on the Past, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Also, please tell your friends and leave us a review. It really helps people find us. We're a new podcast and trying to grow our listener base, so please share. Thanks, and thanks for listening.